Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum and a very good morning. Uh, today we have a special talk uh, on title uh, The Quranic Perspective on Geology. Will present by Mr. Hifzi Zain Zamri. Actually, he is one of our alumni, graduate 2018. So, inshallah, today we we will have this um, very interesting topic actually. So, without ado, uh, I would like to invite uh, Mr. Hifzi Zain to present. Please welcome. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين الحمد لله ثم الحمد لله كده كمبل في هذا اليوم. قبل أن نبدأ، سامي سامي، سأي نأجا أن نبدأ ملكان. نبدأ نحن 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 سرّات الذين إن أنت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين أمين. الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. فزوجا السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. Anyways, as what Dr. Hariri has said, we have a guest with us today, but it's been recorded. So I would like to ask for your permission to deliver this talk sedikit sedikit lama-lama jadi sedikit okay, kan okay. nak sampaikan dalam bahasa Inggeris lah sikit apa yang penting apa yang important points or interesting facts and uh, knowledge I will try to deliver to li deliver it in English and yang berapu-rapu semua bahasa Melayu supaya dia orang tak faham okey <laughs> okey so kalau boleh kita santai-santai saja sebab hari ini uh, Personally, this is a very interesting topic that I I have been waiting very long to deliver to you guys. It's a perspective on how we as a Muslim scientists, guys, we as a student who are studying in, in any scientific field, we have to have a different mindset uh, on how we look at science or how we look at geology in specific. What we are going to look at today. So, are you guys so far good with my English? Because macam macam karat karat sikit. <laughs> okay, anyways, boleh kita kita mula. So kita cuba banyakkan interaksi. Kalau boleh tak nak start stay viva, tegang saya seorang cakap, gigi kat depan, tunggu je bicara bila nak tanya soalan. Okay, so apa-apa kalau ada soalan, if there are any questions to be asked or anything important things that you want to add up, please just uh, raise up your hand and uh, shout out what you want to tell. Okay? So basically, uh, what has inspired me to give this talk today was an experience like five, six years ago. It was a trip to Broga Hill. Has anyone been to Broga Hill before? Angkat tangan. Bila tu? Mungkin tahun ni, tahun lepas mungkin kan? One years, two years before. But if, if you see in the picture, sekarang tak macam ni lah. This was like five or six years ago. It was all green. The hill was very, very nice. Very beautiful actually. But when I was uh, on my hiking, hiking kan, kita panggil hiking lah juga walaupun berapa meter je yang tinggi <laughs> Kita naik Bukit Broga bersama beberapa rakan lah time tu, kita bawa student-student UKM uh, I noticed one observation that shocked my mind actually One is that uh, our mentality as a student or anyone who has Instagram, Facebook or Twitter When we go up and see this beautiful scenery about the universe, the nature the green grass, grass, and the you see, uh, very small. If we uh, we compare ourselves from up there, okay. So when we see these kinds of scenery, the first thing that we will do or that comes to our mind is what? Taking pictures. Thank you. Nak katanya dah memang sebati dalam diri kita. Apa budaya ataupun habit untuk kita ambil gambar ni. So basically, I noticed one thing that really shocked my mind. There, there's this one girl, actually. Uh, sorry, it was a girl. She was a girl. So what she did was, uh, she found a very good scenery for her to take a picture of. So she asked her friend to take her picture. So when she posed, okay, very nice picture, then he hand up, hand the handphone to her. And she did this reaction like, Oh my god, my book, oh my god, lawa gila gambar ni, cantik. Kalau macam tu lah reaction dia. Okay? So, my point is, when there are like scenarios like this, 
the first thing that we tend to do is we tend to take pictures and we are very uh, cepat untuk kita nak sebarkan atau kita nak share dekat Instagram ataupun Twitter ataupun Facebook kita. I am not against taking photos about beautiful scenery, no. But it's our mentality, our mindset towards all this creation that Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala created for us. And in the meantime, I went there. That was the first time I went, and all that I could see up there was total humility. I didn't put out put out my handphone, but but just to observe the nature, the scenery from up here. It's not that high, you know, Broga Hill. Semalam borak dengan Dr. Tajun. Dia dia gelak kat saya. Ni baru Broga Hill belum lagi pergi dekat New Zealand, dekat bukit-bukit lagi tinggi, lagi gah, lagi cantik tu kan. But my point here is, bila mana kita dekat atas ni kan, kita akan sedar betapa kecilnya diri kita dekat bawah-bawah tu. We are very, very small compared to what we uh, have always perceived about us. And realizing this, guys, realizing that we are very, very small, and that this ver the very big universe that Allah has created, Allah has picked you and me to be His servant, to be the Khalifa of this world. He chose in any of His creation, He chose us to give His divine Quran as a guidance. That's one thing that I, I was shocked. The second thing is that up there, we could see how small we are in a perspective that we see ourselves doing what we want to do, what we like to do, and you can see all the universe, the scenery, the, the big nature, the big creation that Allah has created for us, and that, that in that reality, kita tak sedar pun sebenarnya kita buat apa yang kita buat, apa yang kita suka buat, tapi Allah sentiasa perhatikan kita. Kita sebenarnya sangat kecil, sangat kerdil, dan kita rasa kita ni boleh buat semua benda yang kita boleh buat. And to be honest, at that point and stage, that uh, experience, I cried at that moment, realizing the state that we have been given by Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, how small we are. So this experience, the Broga Hill, just created a mindset or a, an idea actually on how we have an opportunity, a big opportunity, on how we should look at the universe, how we should look at geology itself. Because we have a very, a very good opportunity to see the world in a very different perspective as other students don't get the chance to look at. For instance, before you guys went into geology, you see like rocks, papa singkapan lah kan? Apa yang korang tertrigger dengan tu sebelum join geology? Oh, batu je lah kan? Betul tak? Kalau sekarang, bila dah first year, second year, kita dah belajar pasal batu, kita dah belajar jenis-jenis batu dan sebagainya, Kita tengok gambar kawan kita yang sedang ambil gambar di sebalik singkapan Kita nampak tak gambar kawan kita tu tu? Tak <laughs> Kita tengok benda kat belakang tu kan? We see about the rocks and the black Because we have that Knowledge So what I'm going to deliver to you guys is just an added lens Because today you you are uh, trained to have a geological lens Okay We see the rocks, we see the world in a in a different way than other people have, which is the geological lens. Today, I just want to add another lens. Okay, siapa yang pakai spek, mungkin diorang akan faham lah. Banyak tambah power dah ni. Lebih kurang kan. So, what is that lens? It's the Quranic lens. We as a Muslim, we have another responsibility. We have another opportunity. It's not a responsibility actually, but another opportunity that any other people who doesn't study science, they don't have the chance to feel this emotion, this Iman, the faith that we can guide ourselves with when we study the geology, we study any kind of science. Okay? So are you guys up to this? Boleh? Follow? So basically, in my short presentation, <clears throat> I will give three objectives. The first thing is how the Quran wants us to perceive science. Okay, like, like I said before, how we perceive science as a Muslim should be different than other people look at science. Okay, that's the first thing. The second thing is I would, I would like to share some of the geological <laughs> miracles. Okay, geological miracles. Miracles apa nama Melayu? Keajaiban. Keajaiban. Bahasa Melayu betul tu. Mujizat. Okay, tu dalam bahasa Arab lah. Okay. <laughs> mujizat. Geological mujizat. Oh, ambil kau. Geological mujizat di dalam Al-Quran. Okay, that's the second thing. 
And the third thing is about how Muslim scientists should think. I will try to share with you how we as a Muslim have to ha have the system thinking that when we study science, we study geology with our lecturers in the class, we have to have this systemic thinking. And I will deliver that in the end of the, my presentation, inshallah. So the first thing is about how the Quran wants us to perceive science. So this is an ayat of the Quran, uh, the intellectual. Let me read it out for you first. Auzubillah minash shaytanir rajim. إن في خلق السماوات والأرض واختلاف الليل والنهار لآيات لآيات لأول الألباب سلام الله عليه وسلم سؤال تأسيد أنت ما أعرف there truly are signs in the creation of the heavens and earth and in the alternation of the night and day for those with understanding Try focusing on the ayat Ulul Albab. In the Quran, there are a certain criteria on how Allah wants us to see a four flat student or a PhD student or a professor, a degree, a PhD. Ulul Albab, any ayat that you come across in the Quran that has the word Ulul Albab, basically they are the intellectuals that Allah recognize that. Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala inilah Allah iktiraf sebagai orang-orang yang bijaksana. Kita tak nak ada satu penilaian orang yang bijaksana, orang yang pandai di kalangan kita bukanlah menurut neraca manusia. That's one thing. PhD, masters, degrees, that's one thing. Tapi this is from the eye of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. Who are the intellectuals? Okay, do you guys follow me so far? Okay. So this is a definition. Of a PhD student or a PhD candidate, a doctor, PhD professor, madam, whatever you call it, in the eyes of Allah. So we have to pay a very, very uh, focus on this ayat actually. Okay. So Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala state, who are the ulil albab actually? Those who are in this ayat actually. Alladina yadkuruna Allah kiyaman wa qoodan wa ala junubihim wa yatafkaruna fi khalq al-samawat wal ard. Rabbana. ما خلقت هذا باطلا سبحانك فقنا عذاب النار. Who are the intellectuals? Allah stated in this ayat who remember God standing, sitting, and lying down. Wherever he goes, he will remember Allah سبحانه وتعالى. Not in mosque, not in masjids, not in ceramah ceramah ustad ustad. No, anywhere he goes, in the nature, wherever he is going, hiking or anywhere in the world, he will what? Remember God. And then when he sees all the beautiful sceneries, creation that God created, he will say what? Our Lord, you have not created all this without purpose. You are far above that, so protect us from the torment of the fire. This is the result. This is the ending conclusion when we see nature, when we see the world, when we see geology. We see geology is not from the geological perspective only, but when we see all these, his, uh, the, the knowledge that we have been given in this geology, the result is that we increase our remembrance towards Allah and we pray this. Rabbana ma khalaqta hadha batilan subhanaka fakina adhabanna. Try to memorize this dua, guys. Because here in UK we are very blessed, actually. We have many field trips. So all, in all those field trips, try to add this lens towards your uh, observation, towards all your field trips, alright? Try to... Uh, take a perspective towards what can I relate to this to God, and this should be our conclusion. Rabbana ma khalaqta hada baatilan subhana fatina adabanat. We have a very big issue today. That is, we study geology, but we didn't achieve to this conclusion. We study geology, and then the the end result is our uh, results in the exam. Or we get this observation and the result from our field trip, our observation, and so on and so on. But we don't achieve this guideline or this result, which is remembrance of Allah. It should increase our remembrance towards Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. So this is the objective, or uh, this is the end result of us being a Muslim scientist or Muslim geologist. Anywhere we go, guys, anywhere we go. It should increase our remembrance to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala and increase our fear, our faith towards Him. It's based on this ayat, okay? And let's let us see some uh, historical people who did so. 
So this is the story about Ibrahim AS, Nabi Ibrahim AS Saya rasa semua pun pernah dengar kisah ini Sangat menarik sebenarnya Nabi Ibrahim AS is the father of our religion actually Millata Abi Ibrahim Hanifa We say in our Maqthurat Zikir He is the father of our religion Okay, so when we say the father of our religion He he, he has the most uh, perfect uh, tawheed of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. So how did Allah Subhanahu how did Ibrahim AS found God? How did he perceive that there is no God except Allah? He didn't learn that from books. I'm sorry to say, as we are doing it today. But but Nabi Ibrahim AS being the father of our Deen, our Islam, he came up with the conclusion that there is no God but Allah only by observing nature. You see, guys, this is what we want to do. Let's let's see this story first, okay? So, in Surah Al-An'am, actually, I didn't put up what Surah and Ayat. I'm very sorry. This is Surah Al-An'am, and it's in the verse of 75. In this way, we showed Abraham God's mighty dominion, dominion over the heavens and the earth, so that he might be a firm believer. Basically speaking, Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala showed Nabi Ibrahim Ali Salam all the beautiful creation that Allah has created for humankind. For him to This is the result that Allah wants us when we look at nature. It's so that we have a more firm, we become a more firm believer. Okay? So what happened? He then started off his journey. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, فَلَمَّا جَنَّ عَلَيْهِ اللَّيْنِ رَعَى كَوْكَبًا قَالَ هَذَا رَبِّي فَلَمَّا أَفَلَ قَالَ لَا أُحِبُّ الْعَافِلِينَ The first thing that he looked up was the stars. Then he said, this is my Lord, the stars. This is my Lord. Then, when the, when the uh, stars faded away, what he said, I do not like things that are set. Then he continued his journey. He looked up, the, looked up to the moon. فَلَمَّا رَأَى الْقَمَرَ بَازِغًا قَالَ هَذَا رَبِّي فَلَمَّا قَالَ لَئِنْ لَمْ يَهْدِنِي رَبِّي لَأَكُونَ مِنَ الْضَالِينَ And when he saw the moon rising, he said, This is my Lord. But when it too set, when the moon sets, he said, If my Lord does not guide me, I shall be one of those who go straight. Then he looked up at the sun. He waked up and he looked at the sun and he saw a massive sun. And he said, فَلَمَّا رَأَى الشَّمْسِ بَازِغَةً قَالَ هَذَا رَبِّي This is my Lord. He said, Hada Akbar. This is very huge. So there is a potential that this is my God. Then he said, Falamma Afalat, Kala ya kumi inni bari umimma to shikun. But when the sun sets, he said, My people, I disown all that you worship besides God. Then he came up with this conclusion. Inni wajah to what he ali ladi fatara samawati wal of the hanifan, wama anamina mushkir. Subhanallah. You see guys, Ibrahim AS being the father of our religion, he came up with the conclusion that there is no God besides Allah is because he observed nature. Which is, we have that potential to have that, uh, uh, we have that potential to become like Ibrahim AS. Because out there, people who doesn't learn science like we do, we don't, people who don't learn geology, they don't realize how perfect, how how perfect geology is and that should lead us to God. And that is on our responsibility, guys. But before we deliver to others, we should recognize that first, okay? So Ibrahim alayhi salam, he, he was an observer, he was a scientist. He was an ulul albab, an intelligence who saw the nature, who saw science in a different way than other people can. So that this, this is a kudwa, uh, this is an example for us to to take an example lah. okay so this is the last one okay in this first objective Nabi Musa AS and the sorcerers everyone has heard about this story rasanya semua pernah dengar kan kisah ni kan so apa sebenarnya point dia okay so, so the sorcerers ahli-ahli sihir ni antara ahli-ahli sihir yang paling terkemuka paling berilmu yang telah diturunkan untuk berjumpa dengan Nabi Musa AS untuk berlawan dengan Nabi Musa AS tapi bila mana Nabi Musa AS fa'alqa Musa asahu fa'idha hiya talqafu ma ya'fikun But when Moses threw his staff and lo and behold it swallowed up the trickery So what happened to the sorcerers? Fa'ulqiya saharatu sajidin And the sorcerers fell down on their knees This is the second result that we want when we 
we build up our knowledge on uh, things. Because the sorcerers, they have the most knowledge. They are the most knowledgeable people about sorcery. Okay, but even though that they are the most knowledgeable, and there are things that Nabi Musa alaihi salam did as a mujiza, the 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 ulading, the snake. And it swallowed up all of the all, all, all of those sorcerous trickeries. Then what did the sorcerers do? They fell in sujud. Okay, this is for ourselves. This is this is a message for ourselves. Okay, from primary school, secondary school, and now we are here in the universities, guys. Our knowledge about science, our knowledge about geology has increased year by year, day after day. But has that knowledge that we gain made us? Like the sorcerers, the more knowledge that we gain, the more sujud that we make. Okay, so this is the result that we want when we study geology. Then they said, "Kalu amanna bi Rabbil Alamin." They come up to the conclusion there is nothing, nothing that can perce perceive our knowledge about the sorcery. Nabi Musa, you win. So then they they all proclaim, "We believe in the laws of the world." Rabbi Musa wa Harun. So this is a conclusion for my first objective. What are miracles for, actually? Any any answers from you guys? Because I think you are getting more bored. <laughs> any answers from you guys? What are miracles for, actually? Mujizat, keajaiban. You see, Nabi Musa alaihi salam. Apa mujizat dia orang? Apa mujizat Nabi Musa? Tongkat. Okay, ular. Batu terbelah terbelah laut. Semua tu kan? Itu mujizat-mujizat Nabi Musa AS Apa kegunaan dia? Semua mujizat tu untuk apa? Convince. Untuk convince It's for to, com it's to convince the message that Nabi Musa AS wants to deliver Okay? So, what is the miracle that has been sent to us today? Oh, sunyak <laughs> The Quran So, guys, without the Quran We won't realize how many big of an issue geology is That will make us sujud like the sorcerers how the Quran will lead us to be like Ibrahim alayhi salam that came to the conclusion there is no God beside Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Guys, like I said, it's not enough for us to be a regular scientist or a geologist. We are a Muslim geologist. Every day we, we proclaim ourselves, Ashadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashadu anna Muhammad rasulullah. We have an extra responsibility. We have an extra thing that we have to do. Anything that is related to our field of knowledge, anything that is related with our lives, it must be related towards the Quran. So this is what I'm going to share with you guys. Some geological miracles. I hope this part of the presentation will give some um, enjoyment to you guys, inshallah. Okay, so this, these are three things that um, sempatlah untuk saya nak rujuk berkaitan dengan geological miracles. The first thing is about the origin of iron function of mountain and earthquakes. Everyone studied about this? Second years? Dah belajar kan? Second year kan? Earthquake dah... Dah kot eh Dr. P? Ha, tanya Dr. P terus lah ha. Diorang semua tak ingat Dr. Sistem bumi guys, come on guys <laughs> Okay So let's, let us see this ayat Origin of ayin has been stated in the Quran Surah Al-Hadid ayat yang ke-25 Verse 25 Wa anzalna al-hadid Fihi ba'sun shadid Wa namafi'un lil nas Wa liya'lam Allahu man yansuru Wa rasuluhu bil ghaib Inna Allah qawiyun aziz Let me first explain this In the Quran Guys, in the Quran, there are 114 surahs. Betul? Ya ke? Betul, betul, betul. 111. Eh, 114. 114 surah. Okay, that's the entire Quran. And if we divide 114 to get the center, the middle of the Quran, what number do we get? Kita bukan matematik, tapi... Come on, geology, guys. 57. You're going to calculate it. I don't want to call calculator today. Tak nak kurang, kurang. So 57, we get the number 57. That is the what? Middle number. That's the center of the Quran. And to 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 be amazed actually, when we see ayin is the 57th surah in the Quran. And surah al-hadid, al-hadid means? Wow, gila, korang tahu Arab eh? Oh tak, ayin, ayin. Betul, hadid maksud dia? Besi. And we, if we compare this with the composition of the layers of the earth, guys, we will find a very mir miraculous signs. You see, ni sistem bumi eh. Kalau tak tahu, tolong keluar dari wani. <laughs> In the center of the earth, guys, core, it consists of what? 
ayun. As if the Quran is a representation of the world. The center of the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala stated the number 57, which is Surah Al-Hadid, which means ayun. And the earth, if, and we, if we cut the earth and see the center of the earth, which is the core, it is made of ayun. Subhanallah. I am not going to stop here. Okay, what? Uh, th there's something more miraculous about this actually. The Quran, guys, it has not been um, tersusun, tersusun in English, tolong sikit. Arranged in chapters. Surah Al-Baqarah, esok turunnya Surah Ali Al Imran, the next day, Surah Surah Nisa. Oh, power lah kan. Ali Imran, Surah Nisa dan sebagainya. No. The verses of the Quran were set down ayat by ayat. It was very random. But at the end of the um, wahyu, the wahyu, then uh, Jibreel alayhi salam taught Nabi sallallahu alayhi salam to arrange to, uh, accordingly to this surah, to this surah, what's, uh, what's the first surah, the second surah, third surah, and later on. So guys, try to put in this perspective. If you guys were a writer of a book, okay, and you didn't start writing the books into chapters, chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, like we always used to do. This is, kan? Bab 1, bab 2, bab 3, bab 4 terhancur nak buat apa eh? Apa saya nak ceritanya adalah Ayat Quran diturunkan secara rambam And Nabi SAW, he didn't know about this knowledge This was, this was the knowledge about, uh, that was discovered in the 90s Okay? 90s And, lo and behold How can Nabi SAW, our Prophet, knew about this? He he didn't arrange the Quran. Okay, or well, I know Ayan is in the center of the earth. So I'm going to put Surah Al Hadid in the middle of the Quran. No, he didn't think like that. So this proof, this shows us that this Quran was not created by any humankind because the knowledge wasn't there yet. And how can someone who writes something can say something in this way and then uh, arrange the, the Quran or arrange the Surah in the number of 57? You see guys, this is the number one miracle of Surah Al-Hadid. Okay, let's, let's just proceed. Origin of Ayin. Allah stated here, وَأَنزَلْنَا الْحَدِيدِ أَنزَلْنَا Let's us uh, learn some Arabic. I know we are geologists, but again, we are Muslim, so we have to learn our language, guys. Arab. وَأَنزَلْنَا وَأَنزَلْنَا means we sent down. We sent down what? Besi. Besi. Oh, oh nak sambung bahasa Melayu. Okay, besi. <laughs> We sent down iron. Okay, we sent down iron. Allah didn't uh, say, "Wa uh, khalaqna al hadid." We didn't. Allah didn't say we created iron. But He said, "What? Wa anzalna al hadid." Do you know where was the origin of iron in the first place? What? Oh, sudah. Nak bahasa Inggeris kan macam mana? Okay, good, good. So let, I want to show you a video that uh, summarizes some things about uh, the iron, the origin of iron, actually. For the formation of the mineral of iron, a certain temperature is needed. This necessary temperature exists neither in the earth nor in the sun. The sun has a surface temperature of 6,000 degrees Celsius and a core temperature of approximately 15 million degrees. However, this temperature is inadequate for the formation of iron. Iron can only be produced in stars much larger than the sun, where the temperature reaches a few hundred million degrees. When the amount of iron exceeds a certain level in stars, called a nova, or a supernova, the star can no longer accommodate it, and it eventually explodes. These explosions make it possible for iron to be dispersed into space. All astronomic discoveries have put forth that the mineral of iron comes from huge stars from outer space. Not only the iron in the Earth, but also the iron in our solar system is acquired from outer space. For as we have stated before, the temperature of the sun is not enough for the formation of the iron mineral. What is understood from all above is that the mineral of iron is not formed in the earth, but sent down by being carried away from supernovas.
Okay, that's all. So, what did you guys get from this video, guys? A good night's sleep, no? Okay. So basically, what this man said was the origin of iron was not uh, originally from the Earth's crust. It wasn't from the sun. Because uh, the formation of iron needs a very high temperature for it to be created. So then he, he elaborated about supernova. That was the origin of iron. And when those ions then clustered together and formed that we, that we today call our core. So actually, uh, what I want to say was about this ayat. وَأَنزَلْنَا الْحَدِيدِ The word that was being used by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was very precise. He could just uh, say, وَخَلَقْنَا الْحَدِيدِ And we created ayin. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala being the creator of the universe, He know that this word will be become a miracle for us today to see. Because before the time of Prophet wasallam, they didn't know anything about this, right? They, they don't have the technology to know where was the origin of iron. But today we, we have those technology and we found that iron originally was not from the earth. It was being sent down. So subhanAllah, this was not any knowledge that was given to Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but this was originally from Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala as a sign, as a miracle for us. This is the second thing. Allah stated here, ayin being very berbagai manfaat bagi manusia dan uh, apa, kekuatan yang hebat. Let us think from this perspective. In the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, what do you guys guess what the Prophet or the time used ayin for? Weaponry. Yes. Yeah, so, okay, yes. Exactly. Maybe those are the few things that they use ayin for, which, which is weaponry. But here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say, Wana wa, wa manafi'un lil nas. Ayin give very, very, very much of benefits to humankind. And today we see how we today can live without ayin. These are some of the things that are created from ayin, chips or any components of the house, our house, our phone. Yes, 11, iPhone 11, don't be too shocked. <laughs> what I'm trying to say here, guys, all of these things that we, we are very, uh, kita tak sedar. Kita tak sedar, semua ni adalah wa'anzal dan hadid. Allah Subhanahu Taala berikan kepada kita untuk kita manfaatkan. For us to benefit from. But today we use all of these things in a way that we don't realize that Allah Subhanahu Taala wants us to reach a certain conclusion. Which is what? وَلْيَعْلَمَ اللَّهُ مَنْ يَنْصُرُهُ وَرَسُولُهُ بِالْغَيْبِ This is the conclusion. When Allah Subhanahu Taala created ayat in the first place, He wanted us to use it very beneficial for us وَيَنْصُرُهُ وَرَسُولُهُ بِالْغَيْبِ Which is to help Allah's deen and the Rasul. Which means do anything good with the ayat that Allah Subhanahu Taala created and uh, sent down to us. Okay. So every time you look at your phones, this is, very, this is a very good mindset for us to look at. Every time you look at the phones, this is actually a gift from Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, and this serves as a reminder for us to be very cautious about the things that we do with our phones, with our cars, with our house, because Allah expected us for something to do with this gift, the gift of ayin, which is waliyyalam Allahu man yansuru wa rasulu bil ghaib, is to help out the deen of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. Do anything that is beneficial towards the deen with the ayin, with the use of our handphones. With the use of our house, our cars. Don't drive your cars towards things that make you very close to Allah, very far from Allah. Drive your cars towards places that make you close to Allah. Use your phones to make, uh, to download any apps, anything that makes you more remembrance about Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. Don't download apps that makes you very distance from Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. These are the mentalities that we, have. if we have this mentality as a scientist, that Allah created this ayin, wa anzalna al hadith for us to benefit from and we we should portray our gratitude kesyukuran kita kepada Allah dengan dengan cara-cara macam tadi okay that's one thing the next thing okay semua orang dapat eh poin tu wa anzalal hadid miracle yang kedua mukjizat yang kedua daripada al-Quran ada dalam surah an-naba alam naj'al al-ardh mihada sambung sikit wa 
jarang kita baca Quran dalam bilik musyarat ni kan. Kita halau sikit syaitan-syaitan. Mungkin syaitan tu menyebabkan kita ngantuk time by sub, visa visa. Kita halau. Wal jibal autada. Oops. Wal jibal autada. They will not make the earth smooth and make the mountains as pegs. Kau tahu pegs tu apa? Sebagai pasak. Thank you. Pasak. So cuba bayangkan. Try 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 to imagine this. During the time of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam again. Did Nabi SAW from a uh, from the eyes of the, our eyes sendiri sendirian mata kita sendirian kita tengok bukit gunung kita tahu tak apa yang ada dekat bawah tu no right <laughs> tapi kalau lah kita claim orang claim Al Quran ini direkod oleh Nabi SAW macam mana dia berani untuk kata wajibala atau tak ada aspects kita tengok satu video. The word outed means stakes or pegs, like those used anchor a tent, and they are the deep foundations of geological folds. A book named Earth is considered as a basic reference textbook on geology in many universities around the world. One of the authors of this book is Frank Press, who was the president of the Academy of Sciences in the USA for 12 years and was a science advisor to former U.S. President Jimmy Carter. In this book, he illustrates the mountain in a wedge shape and the mountain itself as a small part of the whole, whose root is deeply entrenched in the ground. According to Dr. Press, the mountains play an important role in stabilizing the crust of the earth. The Quran clearly mentions... Okay, ini boleh tengok kat YouTube. Banyak sebenarnya rujukan dalam YouTube, cuma kita je nak cari ke sana. Ini sebarikan dalam satu video uh, that shows us one thing. That the word that Allah used in this ayat was very precise. Awtada. Which is mean pegs, okay? The the mountains acts as pegs towards the earth. That makes it very stable and doesn't um, follow the quakes if there are any quakes, huh? All right. So basically, in this ayat, I'll give you an uh, a fact actually. This is Mount Everest, guys. Mount Everest, if we see from above sea level, we will calculate it as nine kilometers high, okay? But down there, the pegs. That the mountains that act as a peg, its roots is 125 kilometers. Berapa kali ganda tu? Ha, sudah. Asyik tanya matematik. 14 kali ganda. Lebih kurang. 14 kali ganda dalam. Okay? Kuat tak kuat? Kuat lah sepatutnya kan? Saya nak sama-sama kita lihat satu video lagi. Ini adalah kejadian gempa bumi yang berlaku pada 2015 dekat Nepal. Nepal ni kat mana? Ha oh, geografi pula dah dia ni. Di mana ya? Di Di mana ya? Dekat dengan Mount Everest betul tak? Ke jauh, betul kan? Kita tengok satu video. Video ni panjang, just sebab sedikit saja. Insya-Allah. Beberapa sinari yang berlaku.
Okay, this is a fact actually. Um, these are the casualties that has been reported from the incident of the earthquake in Nepal, 2015. 8,856 total deaths, 22,309 number of injuries, 602,257 number of houses destroyed. And you can read the rest. And did you know guys, the tempo, tempo was English? The period of an earthquake, averagely, it took less than 10 minutes. 30 seconds to 1 minute. Betul tak tanya? Tolong sahih kan? That is the average period of an earthquake that has happened in human history. Only those 30 seconds to 1 minute causes these kinds of casualties. Okay? And these are some pictures. And as you can see, it's very, very... Uh, damaging, all right. And this is a report um, from Xinhua. I don't know. Okay, it's stated here Mount Everest that we saw just a few backs ago that has a pack. Berapa dalam tadi? 125 kilo kilometers dalam. Yang kita kata kuat tadi, Mount Everest shifted three centimeters. Shifted how many centimeters? Three centimeters. Okay. This is the cause of a 7.8 magnitude. Kuat tak kuat 7.8 sebenarnya? Kuat sebenarnya. One of the strongest actually, 7.8 magnitudes. So what is the point that I want to try to deliver to you guys? First thing, I told you that the average period of an earthquake takes about 30 seconds to 1 minute. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala stated here about the day of judgment. Iza zul zilatin arudu Zilzalaha. Zalla, Zalla. This is an, uh, a bit of Arabic. Zalla, Allah. Zalla, that means uh, shaking. Zalzala, it means continuous shaking. Continuous non stop shaking. Is the Zulzilatin earth what's continuing to shake the, the, the earth? Zilzalaha, as it meant to be shaken. As it has meant to be shaken. Okay? And we see this when we, we read this ayat, just an imaginary that the earthquake that has happened in human history and those videos that we see, those destruction are only a few. And in this ayat, there's an, an, another ayat that tells us about the day of judgment. وَتَكُونُ الْجِبَالُ كَالْإِهْنِ الْمَنْفُوشِ And the mountains like tufts of wool. This is a state in uh, Yawm al -Qiyamah. That Allah described the mountains will be like the bedubu yang bertebangan. So try to imagine, try to compare this guy. 7.8 magnitude shifted a mountain with a pack of 125 kilometers deep, three centimeters that have been shifted. Try imagine the day of judgment. The mountains did not just shift, but it what? It was being destroyed, destroyed and being like tough, like wool, tufts of wool. Ibarat bulu-bulu yang bertebangan kalau dalam bahasa Melayu. So, cuba agak macam mana dia punya gegaran tu. Kalau dalam video tadi pun kita dah nampak macam semua orang kebingungan. Tak tahu nak pergi mana, tak boleh nak lari mana. No one can run anywhere because the earthquake is everywhere. And this is the day of judgment. With an 8,000 casualties, how will we try to imagine the day of judgment, guys? Subhanallah. And I want to ex ex extrapolate this idea, this message. I got this from Dr. Tajul. Thank you very much. These are the incidents of earthquakes that has happened around East Asia. Oh, around us, actually. You see? Where are we? Uh, geology. Geography is there. Sini, eh? Semua tahu buat tuan. Okay, we are here. And you see these are the occurrence of earthquakes that has been recorded from 1959 to 2004. Okay? Nothing has happened here yet. But I remember this uh, slide. Actually, I think it was presented by Dr. Zayo. Uh, third year? Second year? Dr. Second, year. Second year. This is one of the things that I remember in every class that I went in Dr. Dajjo because it was so... Bukan nak kata semua tak ingat dalam kelas dia tak, tapi... Ini yang terlipat dengan hari. 
Kantoi Dota. These are a few plates around uh, East Asia. All right, we have the Indo-Australian plate. We have the Australian plate. Tak silap bawah ni kan? Philippine plate, Eurasian plate. All trying to push towards what? Towards where? Towards Malaysia. So you see, these plates are moving towards us, and these are the major faults that are here in Malaysia, actually. So we have to really have a conscious mind that any time, guys, any time, one of these major faults can slip and cause an earthquake. And to be really very, the irony is, every day we walk everywhere in this earth, in Malaysia. Everywhere we go, we don't notice this. We think that we can do everything that we can. We can do whatever we can, actually, without noticing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is trying to preserve us, trying to save us from all of these casualties. You see, guys, we, we didn't learn this. We, we learned this in class. But we, we never try to think as a Muslim lens that every day Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving us a very safe place to live in. And Allah is um, menahan all of these things from happening. Hmm? Hold. Try to hold all of these things from happening. Okay? So these are the uh, forces that, cause, uh, that, that are around Malaysia actually, okay? So, another ayat, maybe for, for a conclusion. This is conclusion from the second objective. هُوَ الَّذِي جَعَلَ لَكُمُ الْأَرْضَ ذَلُولًا فَمْشُوا فِي مَنَاكِ بِهَا وَقُلُوا بِرِسْكِهِ وَإِلَيْهِ نُشُوا It is He who has made the earth manageable for you. Travel its regions, eat His provision, and to Him you will be resurrected. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this ayat, He has claimed that Allah has made this earth ذَلُولًا What is the meaning of ذَلُولًا? Here it translated as manageable. But Dalulan means that Allah has made the earth humble for us. He didn't cause any earthquakes for us, for it to happen. It doesn't, uh, Allah didn't make the earth to erupt any volcanoes for us, for it to happen. But it made us humble for who? For us. For, for us to what? From Shufi Manaki Biha. For us to travel its region, its his provision, and to him you will be resurrected. So this I want to bring to you in this second objective is our mindset as a Muslim scientist, guys. It's not a ju just about the science, but it's the blessings. It's about the ni'mah. It's about all the things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put before us for us to be more grateful to Him, to have a better faith in Him. This is the level that we have to bring us to and we have to bring the community to because they don't realize all these geological things, guys. That is the burden that has been given to you. The knowledge is with you. But if we don't deliver this, guys, it, it, it will just be merely a knowledge that doesn't bring us back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay? So this is the second objective that I want to share with you guys. I hope uh, some insights will make you more eager to know more, try to research more back home. And uh, inshallah, we will gain things, more interesting things, inshallah. So this is about the third objective. This is the last thing, inshallah. So how Muslim scientists should think, actually? Okay, how Muslim scientists should think? I would like to show you a video. Another video. Alhamdulillah. Okay. Bismillah. Okay, guys. Or as it should be known, the Golden Ages. Who are you? I am Al Jazeera, engineer and ingenious inventor. I thought you said this was the Dark Ages. It doesn't look very dark. That's because it's all a matter of perspective, my soon to be illuminated friend. Of course, there are parts of the world that weren't dark at all, but in a civilization that stretched from Spain to China, the golden rays of discovery and invention shone over everything. What civilization? The Muslim civilization, my young friend. Through scholars and scientists of various faiths, 
Some of the most important discoveries known to man were made at this time. Discoveries that drew on knowledge of the ancients, but have more connections with your modern world than you could possibly ever imagine. Like what? Well, all sorts of things. I've got to get a picture of this. I knew it was a good idea. Who are you? Allow me to introduce Ibn al Haytham, a great scientist whose ideas led to the invention of the camera. You invented the camera? <laughs> I laid the foundations for modern cameras by explaining how our eyes work. I found a way of projecting an image onto another surface to a small hole in a dark room, later called Camera Obscura. Think of all the things that evolved from this discovery. Cameras, cinema, all share the same principle. Cool. Look up below! Who's that? That's my good friend, Abbas Ibn Farnas, who gazed up to the heavens, passionate in his belief that man could fly. Cool. Indeed. He dared to dream about flying a thousand years before the Wright brothers. Do you know you all take your jet-setting holidays for granted, so it only seems fair to remember Abbas Ibn Farnas. Stand by! I'm ready for takeoff! Useful for that. Ah, my back. Is there a doctor in the house? Did someone call? Ah, my old friend, why don't you introduce yourself to my young guests? I am Abul Qasim al Zahrawi. Many call me the father of surgery. Did you actually do surgery back then? Of course we did. In fact, many of the surgical tools that I invented are still used in your modern hospitals. Excuse me. The patient needs my attention. Scalpel! I think I may need some sleep gin. In that case, I'll use cat gut. Cat gut? From the gut of animals. Perfect for stitching up internal wounds. Your surgeons are still using it today. Sorry, mustache. Okay, that's just a, a view. You can search it up in YouTube. We just went halfway. Actually, I just took it from the middle, actually. So you can search 1001 Inventions and the Library of Secrets. Okay? So what's my point, actually, uh, trying to show you about this video? We tend to forget our history, our Muslim history as a Muslim, that when the, when the Dark Ages fell upon the Europe, the Islamic... That's, uh, the Islamic civilization. We went through the Golden Ages. And what happened during those years where the Europe's, they were in the upper Zaman Gelap, kan? Upper Dark Ages too, is that our scientists, they came, uh, came across knowledge, creativity, innovations that were the starters, the pioneer of the innovation, the technologies that we have today. Okay? And some of them, the, uh, the that was shown to you just in, uh, in, the vi in, in this video. You can watch it later. But my point here is, uh, okay, these are some also. Ibn, Ibn Sina, I think everyone has heard of him, Ibn Sina. He wrote a book on Qanun Fitib, was one of the longest medical library in Europe than any other books in history. Al Khawarizmi founded and created the modern trigonometry and algebra. There is a creator of the moon named Al Hazel which was named after al Hassan ibn Hayta because of his contribution to what? Optics and luminosity. Luminosity. Okay. Anyways, I'm trying to deliver to you guys. These, these were the scientists of the Golden Ages. They were Muslims, just like us. But the question that arises, why don't we have or excel the, the way that they excel? They needed science. They needed science. Okay, guys? Europe was way, way back. They led science for the civilizations of the humanity. Okay? 
And we have a job to do as a scientist. You guys are not. Saya ni penceramah je. Tak ada. Okay. So this is a, a model, okay, that I call Heaven to Earth, HTE framework, okay, HTE framework. This is how the Muslim of the Golden Ages thought, the scientists of the Golden Ages thought, okay. So it began with the Quran and Sunnah. It began all the things that technology, the innovation, the knowledge, it all was originally from the Quran and Sunnah. And from that, they extracted values. They extracted attitude, habits, any cultures that are stated in the Quran on the Sunnah. Then they turned it into knowledge, a kind of skill, science, thinking tools or system. Then from knowledge, they turned the knowledge into what? Innovation, technology. Let me give you an example. Okay, this is Jabir ibn Hayyan. He is the father of chemistry. Didn't you know that? He is the father of chemistry. So what he did was, he used the HTE model. Heaven to Earth model. From Surah Al-Furqan, verse number 48, I'll show you here. The verse said, هُوَ الَّذِي أَرْسَلَ الْغِيَاهِ بُشْرًا بَيْنَ يَدَيْ رَحْمَتِهِ وَأَنزَلْنَا مِنَ السَّمَاءِ مَا أَنْ طَهُورًا Is who sends the winds and heralds of good news before His mercy. We sent down pure water from the sky. This is the verse that uh, made Ibn Ajabi Ibn Hayyan think about. And he wanted to make something that can create pure water. So the values that he extracted from the ayat was ma and tahura, which is pure water. Then from pure water, he tried to think about how do we create pure water. Okay. Then he thought about distillation. Korang ingat lagi tak? Distillation. Ini time sekolah dulu ni. Kan, distillation kan? So from distillation, he carried out an experiment and found or created an innovation called Al-Ambiq. And this is the model of Al-Ambiq. Similar to the modern distillation that we have today. See guys? So this was the pioneer of how we can get pure water from the process of distillation. Jabir ibn Hayyan was the pioneer of it. And he taught the process, he, he took it from the Quran and the Sunnah. And he just taught through the heaven to earth model. Okay? Another example. It's Abbas ibn Firnas, the guy with the flying thing and crashed. Okay? How Muslim scientists should think? Abbas ibn Firnas, he was the earliest attempt in aviation. If you guys read much in general knowledge, the, 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 the general thing that people will say is that the Wright brothers, they, was the, they were the first to attempt on aviation. But actually, thousands of years back, hundreds of years back, Abbas ibn Firnas was the first one, the first one to attempt in aviation. He did the same thing. Heaven to Earth model. He take from the Quran and Sunnah. He look, he tadabur, he look at what innovations that he can do from the ayat, and he saw an ayat. Awalam yaro ila tayri fauqahum safati wa yabil ma yusikuhuna ila rahman inna hu bi kulli shayin basir. An ayat about a bird. Okay, do they not see the birds above them spreading and closing their wings? It's only the Lord of Mercy who holds them up. He watches over everything. So basically, he looked at this ayat and he's. And he stumbled upon the birds flying. Then he tried to find out what is the mechanism to fly. This is the knowledge, the mechanism. So he attempted to fly. And this was the uh, design of the picture that, that was stated about the first aviation that took place in human history. Abbas ibn Firnas. Okay? And ho, lo and behold, this was the pioneer of how we can fly today. Okay? He started off with this, and he didn't start out of it, but it started from the Quran. Okay. The last example is a guy named Ibn Haytham, the father of modern optics. He was in the video too. So basically, he looked upon Surah An Nur, Surah number twenty-four, verse number forty, and from that verse, "Aw kasayibin, aw kazulumat in fil bahr luji yarsha hu maujum min fauqhi mauj." من فوقه سحاب ظلمات بعضها فوق بعض إذا أخرج يده لم يكد يراها ومن لم يجعل الله له نورا فما له من نور. This is a verse about the disbelievers. The disbelievers are like shadows in a deep sea, covered by wave upon wave, with clouds above, layer upon layer of darkness. If he holds out his hand, he is scarcely able to see it. From this verse, Ibn Haytham. He found out the ability to see with the eyes. 
Okay? So he then found out a knowledge using light rays that are entering the eye. We see it's not because of the light rays that come from our eyes, but from the object. Okay? So he found out, found out this knowledge and then came across an innovation called Camera Obscura. As you can see here, guys, Camera Obscura, how, uh, cam how image can be portrayed on a screen. This was the pioneer of televisions, movies that we watch today. Okay? This is how the Muslim in the Golden Ages think like, guys. And you see how those innovations led to multiple technologies and knowledge that we still use today. But today, we see us today. We have to bring up, bring back this golden ages. And it starts us by interacting with the Quran. Like I said earlier on, we are different from any other scientists out there. We are Muslim scientists. And we have to think in an in a, in a upper level, guys. We have the Quran, the most uh, limitless knowledge that we can have until Yawm al Qiyamah, actually. But we fail to look upon it. We fail to tadabur. We, we fail to interact with the Quran. That from the Quran, you can make a PhD thesis, you know, just with one ayat. Recently, I, uh, I met a, a lecturer uh, in UIA. He said to me, Zaim, uh, just look at this one ayat. You can do a PhD thesis, you know. Uh, his specialty is in management and something like that. Huh? So basically, if we have this mentality, heaven to earth model in our minds, to see the Quran in a way that we have to study, and we can make innovations from it, we can really make something good out of it, you know? The knowledge that we can do, the innovations that we can do. But this is the last part of science, actually. The first thing is to appreciate it, is to have a better belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and the last product is about innovation. So, as a conclusion, this is just a review. If you don't learn anything from the past slides, just hold on to these three slides, uh, the, these three points. The first thing that Allah created the universe with a purpose, which serves as a reminder for us to be humble before Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. This is the first thing, guys. Whenever we came across any knowledge that we have or uh, we get from class, this should be the end result, which is humble before Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. The second thing, there are many miracles in the Quran that should leave us in awe of Allah's word and making us a better believer. That's the second thing. And the last, we need to revive how we should think as a Muslim scientist, which is from the Quran. We can gain many, many things about knowledge, about creativity, about innovation, technology. Okay? So, with that, uh, I thank you for your patience and your time to, to hear about this presentation. I hope it opened your eyes on the Quran. It's, all, it's just about the Quran. I, I just want to bring the Quran more closer to scientists, more closer to science, so that we take a better interaction, even though we are not students from FBI, guys, but we still are Muslim. The FBI, they won't look at these ayats. They don't have the knowledge to see these ayats, guys. They can see from the religious, religion's perspective. But the science perspective, you have to do that. You have to convey that message to, to, the, to the community, to the world. Okay? So I hope, uh, the last thing that I hope, actually, is for us to better up our interaction with the Quran. Okay, so that's all for me. Thank you very much for your attention, for your time. And there's a, one announcement that I would like to make. If you are very interested in these kinds of topic, I found a reference that you can use uh, to, to have a more knowledge about these kinds of area. Quran Science uh, is a book called Quranic, uh, Q-STEM. Menurunkai rahsia STEM dalam Al-Quran. Q-STEM. STEM ni benda yang tengah popular sekarang. STEM tu Science, Technology, Engineering. Matematik. So, Q stem. Quranic stem. Okay? So, boleh dapat kat belakang. Bukan free. You will be Okay? So, boleh dapat, boleh bayar kat saya lah. InsyaAllah. Itu saja. Thank you for your time. Uh, pasak. Pasak. So, what is your opinion, pendapat eh, mm. uh, regarding our quarry activity? Quarry activity? Yeah. What about it? So, do you think it's good or not to 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 allow it as a fact? Oh, okay. That's a very good question, actually. And the answer is in the ayat that we have just uh, gone through. Actually, this ayat. Huwa alladhi ja'ala lakum al-abdhalulan famshu fi manaki biha wa kulu min rizki wa ilayhi nushu. This is the answer towards your question, I think, doctor. Which is that, yes, Allah made the, the earth humble for us with the creation of the mountains and all, all, all of those things. 
But its use is for what? Famshu fi manakibiha. Allah doesn't say famshu ala man ala manakibiha, but famshu walk fi. Fi means what? In. It's in. It's not on. It's in. So Allah subhanahu wa taala doesn't want us only to walk on this earth, but where? Go under. Okay, just discover about the quarries. That those are the risk that Allah subhanahu wa taala gave for us to make as a resource for for benefiting of of human humankind. So there is no wrong from the the quarries, but I think there are laws that we have to uh, check out about the how to balance between quarries and environmental issues and all of this these things. I think uh, in the geological knowledge, I think those dah dah dikonsider kanah benda tu. But in a Quranic perspective. Tak ada masalah benda ni. Bahkan Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala galakkan kita kan. Fam shu fi mana kibiha. Walk, walk in any direction that you want. Travel its regions. Okay. So betul. You know what? Okay. Tu saja. Juhaz. Betul jangan soal geologi. Are they just unfortunate or because they are they have lots of sin? Thank you for that question. Thank you. Actually, Doctor Biva, I I discussed this with my friend, my Indonesian friend, Ilham, yesterday. I I I asked him, what's your opinion, Ilham? You're you're Indonesian citizen. When people said that, oh, Indonesia kena ke pembumi sebab dosa banyak. Ken, agak-agaknya, ayolah, macam mana perasaan diorang sendiri yang cakap ni kan? Saya expect jawapan lain lah, tapi Ilham cakap, ah, memang kita ada banyak dosa. <laughs> my opinion, doctor, my opinion, we don't have any rights for us to say that those tech or those earthquakes happen because of people's sin. We are not 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 a judge. Who's the judge here? Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. We have no rights. Even if there is a chance that those are the signs of uh, people doing sins and everything, that is for Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala to judge, not us. Even though they are signs, we can't judge them, but Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala will judge them. Okay? So when people say that, oh, there's an earthquake because there, there are many people doing sin there. How about the kafirs countries that you know, they are young, tak the Muslim, tapi tak kena kebun bumi. Itu macam ni pula nak bahas kan? Uh, so we have to really think about this lah bagian ni eh untuk kita uh, tak terlalu teriari untuk cakap oh itu kuat je dosa 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 okay so because kita sendiri kita sebagai seorang Muslim kita percaya yang kita adalah uh, hanya orang yang menyampaikan Quran bukanlah kita yang menghukum orang tapi kita kat Malaysia ni suka sangat hukum tu jalan kau dah alright that's a very good question actually any question yeah so Assalamualaikum <laughs> Banyak besar tu adalah di seluruh dunia. Ya betul. Tetapi uh, mungkin di dalam Quran dia ada terhad dia, dia dia mungkin tak cakap di seluruh dunia. Mungkin uh, uh, maksudnya how banyak besar tu impact kepada geological features adakah any evidence ke ataupun uh, benda-benda tu lah. Thank you very much. Oh, itu boleh buat PhD juga tu. <laughs> Serius eh? Itulah nak ceritanya dalam Quran banyak benda yang kita boleh relate dengan geologi sebenarnya. Ya orang-orang macam orang kat depan saya lah yang akan menggalas semua jawab tu cuba kaji dan it will bring lots of new insight and uh, we hope that, that those insights will make us more believe in Allah Subhanahu Taala's word in the Quran how precise it is how beautiful the words are and make us more a better believer lah, insyaallah and everybody else thank you for that uh, advice okay. so ada lagi silakan Petrol system relating to the Quran. Petroleum system. Petroleum system. I'm sorry, I don't have any knowledge about that. Allahu Akbar. 
Thank you.